this. It's the summer of 2011, Newark, New Jersey. Newark Municipal Court and Newark Community Solutions hosts its second community advisory board meeting. The first one was a bust. We had two people show up. I believe that they thought that, like the, anyone see the movie Sea of Love? If anyone knows what I'm talking about, in that movie, people who had open bench warrants were sent letters that they were invited to meet a Yankee breakfast, to a meet a Yankee's breakfast. When they showed up, they all got arrested. I think that's what the community thought we were doing with these community advisory board meetings. But the second one, we were a little smarter about them. We decided that we would call people and personally invite them, especially including the judge. And we also partnered with Rutgers University. And we had one of their graduate students show up and give her findings of a report, of research she had been doing on the impact of open bench warrants on the lives of young African American men in the city of Newark. As we prepared for this conference, um, people started to come into our courtroom. I was so excited to see the pews fill up. And we began our community advisory boards with this panel. About five or 10 minutes into this meeting, five people, like the Jackson Five, march in. And I recognize them as the community gadflies. They show up at every council meeting, get on the list of hearing of citizens, and scream and yell at the council meeting and members until they are escorted out by the police. Oh no. They sat down and positioned themselves in the courtroom and waited for the Q&A. When the Q&A came, the young man popped up and grabbed the mic. I mean, he grabbed the mic. And he began to scream and yell. He began to scream and yell about how he had done three years in prison. And after he finished his three years in prison, he was released to the Essex County Jail because the Newark Municipal Court had screwed up. We hadn't cleared up his bail. He was yelling. He was waving his arms. He was calling us incompetent. And we had to take it. Part of what he said was right. We had screwed up. There was a process in place that was supposed to prevent that. We were supposed to respond to this detainer and make sure that it was cleared up so that he could be released. And as he was speaking, I was, you know, practicing procedural justice with my, finch cl my fist clenched <laughs> as he was screaming because, one, I was going to address his concerns, but I was also going to address how he was addressing us. Unfortunately, my chief judge, God bless his heart, decided that he needed to defend me. I don't know why. And he jumps up and he begins to yell, you are now speaking to the chief judge, as if anyone cared about his title. Because what we know is that people don't respect your title. They respect how you treat them. This led to a community pile up on the chief judge because now everyone knew who to direct all their anger towards. After another 10 minutes of screaming and yelling, from everyone, we began to do the most important thing, which was listen. People were screaming, but inside of the screaming, they were telling us how we as, as the municipal court had failed them. What we had done to jam up their license, what we had done to have them miss days of work, what we had done administratively, and there was no recourse. We began, so I apologized. We began to resolve issues. Oh, if you have this kind of issue, it's the court's error, you go see this person. They didn't know that. The chief court administrator got up and was like, anytime this happens, come see me. We began to connect the dots for the people in the community. And by the end of our meeting, they were eating our food. They were grateful. The public defenders jumped in and said, oh, anytime something like this happens, come to my office and pull me out. The prosecutor explained why certain things might happen as well. You see, this is one of the reasons why we are afraid to engage the community. Because we know that if we open our doors, we will have to hear these things. But we have a responsibility 
because we know that we make mistakes in our courthouse. We know that people aren't always treated with dignity and respect. We know that we have employees who, are, who mess up and treat our citizens poorly. But if we want to begin to build partnerships, the first thing we have to do is open our doors. We have to remember that we too are a public building. And while people don't have the right to be in our place and to just be disruptive, they do have a right to come inside of this place. And so today I'd like to talk to, uh, to everyone and I will talk um, to you with Mr. Burley about some of the things that we did. I want us to be focused on some of the creative things that we can do. For some of the judges, the concern is that people will have access to the judge. But what we really want people to have is access to our systems. And sometimes that is having access directly to us. Because sometimes we don't know what's going on in our systems because there's no way for it to get to us. We have an employee who's responsible for customer service and the last thing they do is service the customers. And so what level of responsibility? Anytime you do a survey, anytime you have a suggestion box, you have to, one, brace yourself for the harshness of the comments. You have to, because if you've never asked people to grade you, the first grade you get is gonna be a rough one. And we have to not be afraid of those things. And so I have the privilege and the honor of introducing Mr. Randy Burley of um, New Hope Church and also Fathers on Fire and every other thing that he does there. When we started working with New York Community Solutions, it required me to do something that was a little uncomfortable, which was, it was not uncomfortable for me as an attorney because I was a community attorney, but when I assumed my role as a judge, we were immediately told about creating this space between ourselves and the community. And you cannot do this work successfully if you are not connected to the community or understand it in some way. And so, one of the major things that I started to do was go into the community and visit providers. One of the th reasons that was significant and it was important for me is that we spend a lot of time, and I did, spending a lot of time building trust in the court with court litigants. And if I was sending them to places that didn't provide good service, that impacted how they saw us. And so what I did was use a point person. And Mr. Burley has done everything that we've asked of him. I mean, I sometimes laugh as I'm like, he's not even on staff, but he's always shown up. And so I'm gonna um, talk to you, and we'll, he'll talk to us about his experience in the community of Newark and um, his relationship with the court, and we'll talk about some of the things that we've been able to do together and even with some other organizations. Well, my it, initial contact with uh, Newark Municipal Court, it was a pleasant one, but it wasn't what I was thinking. You know, because it's always the court system been a little difficult when it came to people in our community. And we have a lot of people in our community who go to court and just really don't understand. They don't understand how to deal with the public defendant. They don't understand what questions they ask. They don't understand their rights. So it was like pleasant when I came in your courtroom and you made it available to us that being, me being able to speak for those who couldn't speak for themselves. So it made it a lot easier for me. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with the justice system before there was a Newark Community Solutions, before we even came to Newark, how you experienced the justice system? Well, you know, it was always in a negative way. It was never positive. It was always a fight. You know, even if you had the best lawyers, you still had a fight because you had to defend yourself. And, you know, me coming from an ex-offender's background, you know, I understood how to fight for myself because I had been properly educated but probably 85% of the people in our community are not educated, plus they don't understand anything about the law. So they kind of come in and the public defender is, it's kind of sad to say that they get paid the same rate for everybody. So it's a lot of times that, you know, a guy come in and he's, the public defender don't even know who he is. You know, he'll call him the wrong name. So this guy is like, wow, you know, my life is at stake with somebody who don't even identify with me. So it, it, was, it was definitely a tough, situation for me, you know, knowing that I had to fight, you know, for my life. So I understood. So this was one of the things that helped me to see when I got out of the legal system to start fighting for my community because I knew the fight that was in front of me. What were some of the steps that you took in the beginning when you got out of the justice system as someone who was impacted by the system to begin to help other 
folks in the system? One of the first things I did was I started, you know, studying a lot about the law. I started reading the law books and I started, you know, finding all the answers to some of the mistakes that the court was making and my fight was to capitalize on their mistakes because they made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> you know, so and then I started to see that, well, maybe we need to try to find out the, how to place the courts with the detox system and the mental health issues that a lot of people in our community are going through. You know, do they understand? So that really made it easy when I got to meet Judge Pratt and she understood that a lot of people that came in the courtroom just, just didn't understand. And a lot of people came in the courtroom was high as a kite, you know, and they just didn't know how to function. And some people were passing them through. She began to stop that, you know, to start dealing with that person's issue, you know, on an individual basis. She just didn't put everybody in the box and, well, everybody the same. She said, no, this person needs to go to detox. This person needs anger management. This person needs community service. So it made my work a lot easier. Did you initially, um how did you feel that the courts impacted or even dealt with the community's needs? Did you feel that they at all addressed them or even acknowledged them? Yes, it was like a burden off my back because it made it a lot easier. I knew I had someone in the courtroom that I could go to and explain. For example, uh, that the community courts, they send people to us to do community service. So a lot of times I'm firsthand with that person. So I know once I see him, I can call Judge Pratt's office I can call Raul from the system and, and tell them, listen, this person needs detox. They're going to come back and do the community service. Uh, this person needs mental health treatment. Let's solve this issue first. And then it makes the community service a lot easier. Now he got focus. And so you've been able to kind of use your um, relationship with the court to not only help individuals on the other side, but also to give us a deeper understanding. And that mm -hmm. was one example where someone had pending community service. and your organization was helping them get, actually found them a bed. And prior to that, they would have had to probably complete their community service. Mm -hmm. But you felt that you had um, a relationship with the court. Why did you feel that way? I mean, what specifically was, um, made you feel that way? Because of the open door policy and the respect that you gave me when I came in the courtroom, not only me, but the clients. You know, you just didn't push them to the side and okay, lock them up. You gave them an, an opportunity to win. You know, most of the time when you, know, you go before the court system, you don't have an opportunity to win. I didn't have an opportunity to win when I went to the courtroom. When I, first, when I went, it was, look, Mr. Burley, you're a minister of society, you're this, you're that, without even knowing me. You don't understand why I did some of the things I did. It's always a reason why people do what they do. You know, sometimes you have to look at the school system, where they come from, the community, no fathers in the home and the strength of a mother, the weakness of a mother. It's a lot of different issues that make people do what they do. So it was great for me because y'all opened the door and y'all begin to understand, y'all start to listen. I didn't have to come in and fight Judge Pratt. Look, Judge Pratt, you know, I came in, you okay, what's the problem? What's the issue? How can we handle it? It was open. I'd like to um, talk about some of the very um, non-conventional things that we do also with the help of Mr. Burley. Uh, we, I remember we had a g group of gang members that actually brought a 12-year-old to the courthouse. They actually called one of the police officers who's known for being a community police officer. He had posted a picture of himself uh, flashing gang signs and what looked like a gun in his pocket. And they called the police officer and told him, if you don't get do something about this kid, by the end of the summer he's going to be dead because he's beefing with another gang. And the police officer then brings him into the courthouse and says, okay, well, we need to do something. And I called you because I knew that gang intervention was something that, could ha that was happening in the community through you. Talk to the, if you could talk a little bit about um, the gang intervention. So, I mean, you, you literally have been doing gang interventions at the courthouse in any space that we give you. <laughs> See, the, the key to the gang intervention is finding somebody in your community with some credibility that's willing to change. Not somebody that's trying to play both sides of the fence. Not somebody that's politically astute. Somebody that truly loves their community and willing to give back, but also have some ties to that community. I, I have ties to the community. Not proud of some of the things I've done, but it left a respect and a credibility. So I can go to a kid, I can go to the gang leaders and listen, 
you know, this kid is not for you. He's not ready for this. This is not his lifestyle. He's somebody trying to fit in. Now you have a choice. Either I gotta challenge you or you gotta challenge me. So with the credibility, that's where the credibility counts. They know probably 95% of the people in their clique is gonna follow me. Because I'm trying to teach them now to be creative. It's not about being in a gang. Because being in a gang is not the solution. Okay, you can't jump fences when you're 55. There's no pension when you're 60. There's, I haven't seen a drug dealer yet with a pension plan. So I show the guys, listen, you know, it's about being creative. Most of these guys are hands-on. I show them how to create their own business. We have a kid now, thanks to Judge Pratt Court, he's 17 years old, he has $80,000 $80, in the bank. Never sold drugs or days in, it, in his life. Because we showed him how to create, and we showed him how to bring 10 other kids in, and he sell water. Water is what, $2 a case. Make $24 off each case, right? He split it 10, 14 to 10. But he pay them at the end of the week like it's a job. If they don't have a bank account, he fire them. Because we taught him how to create his own business. The school system said he was illiterate. They said he was bipolar, he was, which he was none of these things. See, so we have to be careful how we label our children. What you speak into your mind, out of your mouth come into existence. So if you tell this kid all the time you're not gonna be nothing, Guess what? He's not going to be nothing. Now this kid's an honor student because the teachers didn't have time to teach him because he was ahead of his schedule because he already knew how to read. He knew the math. He knew the science. But he was bored in the classroom. So guess what he did? He was disruptive because nobody challenged him. So sometimes we in the community, as community leaders and people of the community, you have to learn to challenge these kids instead of being afraid of them. Why are you afraid of a 14-year-old kid? Why? You have to ask yourself that, who am I? You know, what, who do I serve? You know, who I serve, I don't have a fear. So you shouldn't. And guess what, the kid just needs somebody to talk to him, pull him to the side. Hey, listen, let me speak to you for a minute. Let me tell you something. I was 14 at one time. Same choices you made, I made. Stop being afraid of telling your kids about your past. Because we all haven't here haven't been church people. <laughs> And when we go back to this idea of accessing the court, we've also been able to use your institution as a place where people turn themselves in. And so what I like about my relationship with Mr. Burley is that he also helps create this idea of um, legitimacy for the court. Because we have a person who is legitimately in the community doing and having done a lot of the things that some of these young men are looking up to, telling them the truth about it, but this idea of getting them to behave in a way that, one, they get through the program, and that they stop getting into trouble. And that the court is also not afraid to have a relationship with this person or space in the community. One of the, if you could talk a little bit about the, um, the, the grant that Newark mm -hmm. Community Solutions and mm -hmm. New Hope applied for. Mm -hmm. Because they're also one of our community service providers, which is a um, soup kitchen that we have in the community. But what we know is that while we send some of our tougher guys there from the bench, I'll say, make sure you send them to Randy. I know that while they're there, they're going to be speaking potential into their lives as well. Yeah, and that, and that makes a difference. You know, if you can help your community by, you know, finding grants for them, maybe doing fundraisers, because, you know, it, sometimes it takes money. Because sometimes uh, some of the kids come through, you know, that come from the court that need sneakers. Well, he's like, Mr. Burley, you know, you got me here today, but, you know, I don't know how I'm going to eat tonight. So we're able to give them some food from the food pantry. Mr. Burley, you know, my son, man, you know, he's going on a trip tomorrow. So you always have to have some vouchers or something. You'll be able to give back to the community. It's not about just giving, giving, giving. It's about a helping hand. It makes a difference when you got a hand to meet you when you have nothing. And then your pride is in the way because now you got to humble yourself because, you know, I'm a hustler. I'm, you know, I'm this big baller. You know, now you're making me come to the church. You know, so once the guys learn humility, it makes it easier for them to go back to the community and like, hey, look, man, you know, you, you got to stop what you're doing. Let's go talk to Mr. B. Mm -hmm. Mr. B got access to Judge Pratt. You know, I got these warrants. You know, what can I do? So they know it's going to be an honorable connection between the courts and him or her. So, you know, it's about, you know, finding maybe the grant. Some of y'all are strong grant writers. Maybe go to a nonprofit and help them. Listen, you know, you're not gonna get every grant, but, you know, 
let's work together. Now you make the nonprofit accountable. Now you got my name tied to this. That's why Judge Pratt, no, I won't work with everybody. You know, because some people is just not truth behind them. And you know, what I've been taught is to stand on truth. I made my share of mistakes. So it's not for me to continue to do it. So I can't play both sides of the fence. If I'm gonna lead these young guys to the water, guess what? I gotta be righteous. You know, I gotta be strong in my spot. So they always, it's always eyes in the community. That's why you gotta be careful of who you choose when you go into the community. Just because somebody told you, hey, that's big Billy so-and-so, so-and-so. Follow him for a little while. Sit down and talk to him. Because just what come out of his mouth is gonna tell you who he is or she is. It's not about the guys all the time. Our girls are dying. You know, our girls are banging. She's sending us girls 16, 17 years old as, you know, taking more pills than the pharmacy. So, you know, you got to not only look at the guys, but you got to look at the girls too, the little girls. It's a lot going on in our community. That's why it takes everybody. That village to save the community, it's, it's validity behind that. So you just got to look inside yourself and how important is your community. Even though maybe some of you may have moved out of that community, but you still have ties to it. Remember what that community did for you. Remember your destruction in that community. Some of you just didn't get caught. <laughs> what do they say? Um, an ex, an ex, uh, friend, ex offender said to me, "We, um, you just know my sins. I don't know yours." <laughs> <laughs> but to your point, um, with respect to grants, the North Community mm -hmm. Solutions recently mm -hmm. partnered with the New Hope Church and Whole Foods and Whole Foods and wrote a grant so that grant. I think it was $5,000 mm -hmm. they won. So now Whole Foods will provide the seeds to North Community Solutions so our defendants will be planting seeds in our garden and then those, gar those vegetables will be given to, new, to your soup, soup kitchen. kitchen. We so reap the benefits. Reap the benefits and new refrigeration. So this idea that the court could partner and that these programs, yes, could partner with community organizations. Uh, also talking about um, community gardens. We were just talking about Cleveland, about um, the gardens we have. There's a program that the city has that for $1 you can get an abandoned lot. So we've been sending our defendants to actually do community service there. We've also partnered with another organization from another university, Kane College. It's called Be the Change. And one of the things they do there is murder maps for the city. So they map out the highest rate of murders in the city, literally block by block. And they've realized based on their maps that based on the, um, wherever there's a high number of murders, they go in and put up a garden. And so we send them folks to put up gardens. Their studies have shown that where you put a garden up in these very violent areas, the crime rate goes down drastically, drastically. Because now drug dealers, and other people involved will move their business away from these spaces because children will use it, the seniors will use it. So the court now gets involved in looking at reducing the number of violent offenses by just sending people and connecting with an organization. And one of the uh, methods that I've used is calling people. I go through my Rolodex and I call folks. Here, we're doing this thing, I know this could help you. If it's a nonprofit, if it's a for-profit, Here's an opportunity to increase your ability to do community projects because I can send you five people once a week, a couple of times a week. Mr. Burley talked about community, and I'd like, um, could, do we have some microphones up? I'd like us to talk about community. What does it mean, and what do we think? Let's define community. What are some of the important elements of community? Anybody, stand up, back there. I know we have some talkers in this room. So. <laughs> what does it mean? What does community, how are we defining it? What are some of the integral parts of a community? Good morning. Good morning. The people that kind of make up that community um, that's invested in that community. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Somebody else? I'm a professor now, so I just call on folks. <laughs>
incorporating those that have otherwise been disenfranchised from the community, bringing them in and welcoming them okay. to what is considered the community. That is what's considered the community. I think using your, um, a group of people using their sorry, talents. Can you stand just so I can see sure. you guys? Thank you. Sure, a group of people using their talents um, to make a difference okay. uh, in cool. the community. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I am a community leader from the Five Points West area here in Birmingham, but the community is consists of six neighborhoods. We have six neighborhoods. We have a community meeting once a month, and we describe uh, what's going on in each neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And when we find out what is going on in each neighborhood, we come together. And like right now, we have a project that we're doing. Each neighborhood are doing a project. We have a prayer garden. We have another community doing a garden, and et cetera, et cetera. There's several things. So once we get together, we find out about crime. If there's a crime in your area, we all get together. We talk about what you should tell your neighbors and what you should do. Also, we have a police officer to come out to our community meeting, and the firemen, they come out to each neighborhood every month, and then they'll come to the community meeting, and they'll let us know what's going on. So if a lot of people get involved in your neighborhood, in your community, a lot of crime will be stopped. Because if we find out that we have a lot of burglars in this area, we'll make sure that people are aware of it, so they can know that when they leave, make sure you're locking your doors. The community is very good. It's a, it's a family. It's a family. Just like it is with the neighborhoods. Like I say, it's just six neighborhoods with us. And when we get together as a community, it's a family because we talk about what's going on. And then if a new um, person come into a store, We'll talk about letting everybody know we have someone who's new coming in and they have their story. We want you to get involved with it to make them feel comfortable so other people can come into the community. So that's what it's all about. Great. We have one last comment here, Judge. Is that okay over here? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Burley, for your work. I really appreciate that. I think um, the elements of community are, is definitely relationship relationships with the schools, with, with the businesses, with, and, and I loved when he said, make sure when you get somebody, they're not politically driven, that is somebody that can talk to people. So I think community is all about relationship and how do you form those relationships and maintain those relationships. Rabbi Prince uh, gave a speech on the Washington March. Wa mm, March on Washington, not very famous because I have a dream speech came up afterwards, so you know. <laughs> but he said, neighbor is more than the geographical location. It's a moral obligation. And so I want to stretch your definition of community and our moral and professional obligation to the people that we serve or come in contact. That means to me that our corporate partners, our cor corporations are our neighbors, which means they also are our community. And I'm big on telling folks to fight at your corporation so that they understand that social responsibility, corporate responsibility goes beyond one scholarship in the communities where they receive tax abatements. What happens if, even if you work in a community and leave, that, that's huge. You are a part of that community. Uh, this morning they asked us to leave some of our dollars here. Yes, because we are a part of this community. So now that I'm stretching your idea of community, anyone else have a comment about community and our responsibility to these people that we serve? Hi, I'm Amy. I'm from the Bronx in New York. Um, but I, you know, when I, I hear you speaking, I think a lot about um, building trust. I feel like, you know, to play off of what you said, the relationship is so valuable. I, I think about walking, I, I live in the Harlem community, talking to my neighbors, interacting with my neighbors, and, and the way that we leverage that um, builds community. Um, and it can either destroy it or build it. And so we, we have a responsibility to build trust among each other, to care for one another, to uphold right and wrong in our communities. So, yeah. That's a great point that she makes, and I know Judge Calabrese is big on, I think, Judge Calabrese, are you still playing um, softball? Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 
but how your community partners. I had to be seen as legitimate in this community for people to want to work with us as well. And this idea of building our relationship and our reputation in the community through our community partners as well. Um, Randy, uh, what else can be done, do you think, that would help community partners to be more um, amenable to working with us? And that's police departments, that's courthouses, that's prosecutor's office. You know, the first thing we got to do is be accountable of self and then be accountable of your surroundings, everything around you. Nobody in this room is blind and naive of some of the things that's going on. But if you sit back in your house and you continually allow it to go on, then you're at fault. You know, it doesn't matter. Sometimes you have to just step out of bounds, you know, out of your comfort zone and say, you know, what's right and what's wrong. It's not about being argumentative, it's not about being angry, it's not about being frustrated, but it's about, you're wrong. Hey, we gotta do this different. It's about being approachable, mm -hmm. being able to communicate with those that's, that are difficult. Even difficult people can be communicated with. Because you know, sometimes we have some difficult people in the police department, you know, because they think one way, arrest, 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 until, their child is caught up in a situation. You understand? So always remember, it could happen to you. You know, when you see somebody shot, or you see somebody getting robbed, or their house breaking in, don't turn your head. You know, force that situation. Call the police department. Allow them to do their job. But if they're wrong, also approach them. Approach their leadership. Sometimes you can't go to approach an officer because he has a job to do because what his leadership have told him. So sometimes you have to go to the top. You know, so if I got an issue, I go to the top in the police department before the community get crazy. Because if you let things fester, guess what? It's gonna get heated. So you have to have that point person in the community. Everybody can't be a voice. Choose your voice. Choose your voice wisely. Somebody got to be the spokesperson. Everybody can't lead. So you have to choose that person that you know, we're going to get together, we're going to huddle up in this meeting, and we're going to send them out to represent us as a community, as a whole. Choose your leader. I think one of our other fears are also using, um, and it's an underused or, or institution, our faith-based organizations. In our community in Newark, our community is about 60% Christian and probably 40% Muslim. And the idea that they are still the center of our communities, that that is where the trust in most of our communities are. And sometimes we as the court forget that we can use them, not in their religious sense, but in their nonprofit arms and their ability to bring people to courts and to get them through the process. So I often find that that has been a bigger, a bigger fear of, us, of the court as an institution, being afraid of using our faith-based organizations. And one of the ways that we do this again is visiting them when they're doing their soup kitchens to see what kind of assistance that we can provide and showing up to the chaplain meetings. I've gone to chaplain meetings. I've shamed folks when I needed more community service providers because the reality is if you're going to speak on behalf of this community, partner with agencies that can allow you to help them. So. You know, when I show up and I'm like, I don't have one masjid that I can send someone to do community service. And that's just sweeping or a garden. 